the days of the poor old Abbo had gone forever. I'm calling a corroboree of all the natives of New South Wales to send a petition to the king in an endeavour to improve our condition. All the black man wants is representation in federal parliament. There is also plenty of fish in the river for us all and land to grow all we want. 150 years ago, the Aboriginals owned Australia and today he demands more than the white man's charity. He wants the right to live. At that time, the 1930s, the Protection Acts were in full force. The chief protector had the power to send mixed blood children to missions, having wrenched them away from their Aboriginal mothers. In this way, the mothers could continue to serve their white masters, the masters were saved any possible embarrassment, and the children were civilized with Christian ritual. If any Aborigine objected to this arrangement, the chief protector could imprison him or her without trial, all of which, said the law, was to save the natives from being overwhelmed by the white race. In recent years, many of those children sent to the missions have tried to find their families. Well, the first time with me, as the story goes, is my grandpa said, you don't take that kid, you know. So I was left. He stopped him, but then a little, the following year, or months later, he came back again, and then I was out with some other kids, and most of the old people had, had gone away from the station. And so Constable Bill McKinnon was able to take me, put me on the camel and take me, you know, till people realised the day after or the two days after that I'd, I was missing. Yeah. I got European blood in me. My grandfather, my European grandfather, he, come, he, come, he is a Scotsman. He come from Stockton and Tees somewhere, in England, somewhere there. He come over around the border up there. He come here. And he had Aboriginal wives, and he gave his children then his name, my grandfather. But the policeman, under the simulation laws in this time, he's going to go and grab all us grabbed my mothers and all that there and put them in a compound because they were half European or whatever or something like that. <laughs> they put them in a compound. And my old granny, my old black granny, she'll come up there and try to talk to us, but we weren't allowed to. She'd get put in jail or I'd be getting threatened to send up to places like Melbourne and Croker Island. The officials came for us with a policeman in the car and my mother said, you're not taking them. He said, well, I'll have to use this if you don't patting is the case with the handcuffs in it, you know. But we, in our childish imagination, we thought it was a gun. And uh, could we both yell them together, we'll go, we'll go, Mum, we'll go, you know. And, uh, and uh, he was very kind. He tried to be, you know, very kind. And he, my mother said, well, I'm going too. And uh, he still had her apron on and went 25 miles to the Niloquin, and uh, we weren't there very long when the car took us then to Finlay and on the train to Kutamandra. That's a train. Well, my heard years later how my mother cried and cried and she went out. She had nowhere to go, and she went out into the bush, and my old aunt and them who were told of me as they were coming past a certain point right out on the outskirt 
of the Nelakun. They heard us moaning like an animal, you know, and they stopped the buggy and went over to see, uh, and they discovered not that it was my mother lying under this tree and in the tall grass crying. She couldn't mo moaning, she couldn't cry anymore, you know. And uh, they had to care for her and look after her, but we were already on our own the way you might have been in Kutamandra then, by then, you know, by train. But I often wonder how many other children were taken like that, just like animals, because our hearts were absolutely broken. In January 1972, four young blacks set up a tent on the lawns of federal parliament in Canberra and called it the Aboriginal Embassy. Again and again, the police tore it down, and again and again, the Aborigines put it back up, all of which was embarrassing to a conservative coalition government, which found itself explaining to inquiring foreigners the symbolism of an Australian embassy in Australia. It was a brilliant idea which focused a national campaign for land rights and helped to concentrate minds in the Australian Labour Party. A Labour government was elected for the first time in 23 years. It was the first Australian government committed to a policy not of whether there ought to be justice for the Aborigines, but how. Prime Minister Gough Whitlam set up a commission which laid down principles for land rights legislation. In effect, the beginning of real self-determination. One of Whitlam's last political acts was to go to the land of the Gurindji people and become the first white leader to give back a piece of Australia to the first Australians. Viewed against the nightmare that had gone before, the Aboriginal renaissance that unfolded during the 1970s was extraordinary. These are but a few who became public names. Pat O'Shane, first Aboriginal woman barrister, first head of a government department. Charlie Perkins, freedom rider, now head of the Department of Aboriginal Affairs. Mick Miller, pioneer community leader, eloquent foe of Queensland politicians. Kevin Gilbert, poet and author of the first major political work by an Aborigine. Kevin Cook, a pioneer of Aboriginal cooperative training. Essie Coffey, award-winning filmmaker from New South Wales. Justin Saunders, an outstanding stage and screen actress. Marwil Yantelaway, celebrated star of many feature films. David Galpalil, film actor and dancer extraordinary. Mm -hmm. 